Maurice is going to have our sermon today. Not sure. Oh, <laughs> I was like, I didn't know where he was. Thank you. <laughs> Glad. Or else you have to do it. Thank you. Or else you have to do it. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. All right, so I was up here a few weeks ago, and now I'm back up here again. Amen. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the challenges in our lives and that you're there with us. For, for these things are measures of faith. And we ask you to comfort us and direct us and guide us and open our hearts up to the Holy Spirit. Continue to break your bread to us and through the Holy Spirit we'll be filled. Show us your way. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so um, last time I was up here, I talked about Job for a little bit. I like the book of Job. I really love the book of Job. It's, to me, it's like one of the best. Uh, in fact, Job, Job and Revelation to me, I mean, that's it, you know. Job is one of the, the earliest books. Revelation is the last book. And God talks about himself being the Alpha and the Omega, right? Yeah, so that spans everything. So I love the book of Job just to start off with. And I love the book of Revelation. I think they're together. They're not different. So Job 42. We're going to talk about evangelism for a little bit. Step one of, of evangelism. And the reason why uh, behind this, I feel like this pulpit is in my way. I should get rid of it. But uh, step one. Step one has to do with revival. Revival. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Just touching on that a little bit. And then I'll let you go. Not too long. Uh, let you go. So Job 42, right? At the end of the book of Job, so Job went through all these trials, right? And calamities and stuff that none of us, none of us dream of or want to go through. I can't imagine going through the stuff that Job went through, right? And I hope it doesn't happen to any one of us. But at the very end, chapter 42, something happens. God talks. About in 38 or something like that, chapter 38, God, God responded back to Job. He didn't even talk to Job's friends. You know, he responded back to Job, actually. And in, 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 in chapter 42, Job replies back to God. The end, of the, the end of the book, the last chapter, something happened to Job. It's, a, it's what we call those ha-ha moments. You know, a light bulb moment just went off. In the head of Job. And so Job said, after he listens to God talking to him and God counseling him, Job says, right? And Job answers Jehovah. I'm reading from the, uh, uh, whatever, a different version, but you know. <laughs> um, I know that thou canst do all things. Thou can do everything. Nothing is impossible for you, God. That's how I interpret that. But anyhow. And no purpose of thine can be restrained. Who is this that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore I utter that which I understood not. Job was talking about stuff. Remember the back, all that stuff and all those chapters that Job was talking about? Right here. Conclusion. I was talking about stuff I didn't understand. I was clueless. Basically that's what Job is saying after God talked to him. Things too wonderful to me, which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, I will speak. I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I had heard of thee by hearing. It's like rumor. The stuff I know about you, God, is like rumor. But now, chapter 42, now my eye seeth thee. I can see you now. It's not rumor anymore. I can see you now. Wherefore, it says, I have bore myself and repent in dust and ashes. What happened to Job? Last chapter in the book. What's the difference? Job had found revival. Job had found revival. Job had been revived. Job had found revival. A newness came over him. 
the Holy Spirit came over him and he saw God for who he is. Through all of that talking, all of that confusion prior, in chapter 42, revival, revival. Job had seen God for who he is. Revival. Some of the things that jump out to me in there, knowledge. Who is this that hideth counsel without knowledge? We really don't know who God is. We really don't. Not by ourselves. We think we might, but we don't. <laughs> we don't. We really don't know. Things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. Things too wonderful for me, which I knew not. To me, when I read that, it points me to righteousness. I don't know that. I don't know that. That's what Job is saying. God opened that up for him. And finally, in, the, in, in, in chapter 42, revival came along. You know, we're in this process, or, or, or we might be, or we should be, or hopefully we are, uh, that we're talking about something called evangelism down the road, in, which, in whichever regard we want to label it as, as about evangelism. But evangelism, evangelism doesn't come without revival. Job chapter 42. Job has been revived through all the calamities went through and evangelism comes afterwards. Step one for evangelism is us being revived. What is that? Being born again, right? What does that mean to us? It means different things to all of us, right? Uh, in Matthew, uh, in Luke, actually, let's start to Luke chapter 11. Anyway, I think it's in Luke. It's Luke chapter 11, right? And it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, and when he had ceased praying, right, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray. They saw something and they wanted it. They saw this uh, something wonderful or something exciting and they wanted it. And he said unto them, when he pray, you follow this. And you read the verses, right? Right, right. You read all of those. And I'm going I'm to fast forward that down because we know what the prayer is about. I'm going to fast forward that down to verse 5. Because most of the time, this is left off of the prayer. This part is left off. We pray, we, we, know, we know the verses and all that stuff. And he said to them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go unto him at midnight, and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine who has come to me for, from a journey, and I have nothing set before him. And he from within shall, sit, shall answer and say, Trouble me not. The door is now shut, and my children are in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. I say unto you, Thou wilt not rise and give him, because he is his friend. Yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. The point he's driving at, the confusion here that most time is left off the prayer. God saw that they were doing something. The disciples did something amazing. They were asking. They were asking. Show me how to pray. Show me how to pray. They wanted so bad. And God says at the end of the prayer, we need to keep asking. Don't give up. I'm going to teach you this prayer, but you know what? You still need to keep asking God how to teach, show you how to pray. Keep asking. Perhaps one of the problems with our evangelism approach is that we're not asking. We're not asking. And asking in the, in the, in the context of not just to ask, 
but when you ask to do as though what you have asked for has been answered. That's the step. Because we can pray all we want and pray for something and you might say, hey, nothing's happening. Well, may, might it be that we just haven't taken the next step and that will trigger it? May it be that? So what's the problem? What's the problem perhaps with spiritual growth or evangelism? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians uh, <clears throat> Give me a minute. Is this First Corinthians eleven? Maybe. There are three people basically uh, that's in the church. There's three people in the church. There's three groups. One, one that is uh, a natural person, one that is a spiritual person, and one that is a carnal person, right? The book of Corinthians tells us about that, about these people. I'm going to take a little uh, sidetrack here a little bit and read some things from a little book here that I've been studying, and I uh, encourage you to do that. It's, uh, it's not a bad book. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I'm, I'm talking about this book. It's out there in the, out there in the, in the pew. I mean, out there in the... In the um, hallway out there is steps to personal revival so this is one of the one this is step one for the the revival that we're called into being or called to do this is just one of the uh, suggestions we don't have to do this suggestion there's other programs that i think Lori can talk about the fast program but this is a very first step it's called revival to get into talking about who god is to be helpful for your community to show people who God is. We have to be in this constant state of being revived. Not once, but constant state of being revived. And so this is a good text or a good material to look at if you want. Uh, a suggestion, you don't have to. You can find another suggestion if you want. But if you look in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and look at some ideas, uh, and we're looking at verses 14, I believe. It says, now the natural man. So there's three people in a church. There's a natural person, right? There's a spiritual person, and then there's another person. It says, now the natural man received not the things of the Spirit of God, because he's natural. He don't want to talk about God. He just wants to be out there and enjoying his life, right? That's, that's, that's natural. He's like, well, what, I have nothing to do with this. I mean, hey, there's nothing after, uh, after death. We just live as much as we can live today, right? Just live today. It's all for, it's all, it's all for today. But the spiritual, the spiritual judgeth all things, and he himself is judged by no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord that he should instruct him? The spiritual person have the mind of Christ. First Corinthians, right? Chapter 2, verse 15, talks about the spiritual person and having that mind of Christ. How do we have that mind of Christ? Not on our own, right? Something has to put it there. Something has to drive it there. And we all know, we've been uh, studying a while, we know what that is, right? It's called the Holy Spirit. We know that, right? No big surprise about that. 
the Holy Spirit drives the mind of, of Christ in you. And it's continual. And it's continual. A spiritual person is a true Christian. He is called spiritual because he is filled with the Holy Spirit. Here, too, the relationship with the Holy Spirit is a criteria for designating the spiritual person. I'm reading from this book. It's right out there in the hallway. It's a book we're called to study if you want to. You don't have to. He is a... He, Sorry, he has a good and growing relationship with the Holy Spirit. A good, growing relationship with the Holy Spirit. It hasn't plateaued. It hasn't sit in the state where I'm comfortable. It's not there. It's good and it's growing relationship. Other characteristic. The spiritual person has committed himself essentially and completely to Jesus. And as a general rule, this is confirmed daily by surrendering. Daily by surrendering. Not some of who we are, but the whole of who we are. That's the spiritual person. In the remaining few minutes, this is who I really want to talk about today. I want to talk about the carnal person. A carnal person. A carnal person. Because, you see, this carnal person, they're in the church. They're not talking about someone out there going to the bars and all that stuff. But Paul is talking about people in the church. That's what he's talking about. This carnal person is in the church, right? And it's so hard to get an ID or this person to be identified. It's not easy. It's not easy. Because we see ourselves in that a lot. If you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, next one down, it kind of gives you an idea who this carnal person is, right? So Paul kept on going. And 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 4. And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal. Babes in Christ. Babes in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with meat, for you are not able to bear it. I can't give you the hard stuff. I can't give you the real deal. You can't deal with it. You're still on the little things, right? That gets you all twisted around. May not even know, may not even now are you able, for you are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you jealousy and strife, Are you and I carnal? Jealousy and strife. Not that there won't be arguments, right? Sure, there's arguments. But this means continual. There's no growth. No spiritual growth out of this at all. Do you not walk after the manner of men? For when one says, hey, I am of Paul. And another says, hey, I am of this apostle over here. You know, I love this doctrine over here. And I like that doctrine over there. And this is what I'm all about. What is this, Paul says? Ministers through whom you are you believe, and each as the Lord gave you. We fuss and we fight sometimes about stuff. Really, it doesn't matter. But we love it, right? And Paul says, be careful of these things that you follow. Because a carnal member does these things. And we're into all this stuff. And it takes us away from the, the core, the fruit, the real deal that we need to do. Which is to present Jesus to the world. Which is to bring people to him. Because we get into these little sidetrack stuff, right? And we lose focus on what we need to do and where we need to go. Because our day is so consumed with other things. My day is. You know, I come to the end of the week and I'm like, man, what did I do for Jesus this week? 
It's all for me, man. You know, it's all for me. So I am like this carnal man. I am like this carnal man. Church member. It feels comfortable. It feels like the things you, the thing you need to do. You're in your comfort zone. I haven't really gone out of my comfort zone. The carnal church member, who is he? Can you identify this person? How easy it is or how hard it is. It says, Paul mentioned four times that the carnal uh, person, what, what he is, this person lives for the power of the spirit, the power of the flesh. Sorry. Live for the power of the flesh, right? We can get into that, right? Right? I go to the gym a lot, power of the flesh, right? Work out, you feel like, yeah, hey, you're doing great, man. Hey, you're eating right, man. You know what I mean? We live for the power of the flesh. This is a normal strength and abilities a person has. Furthermore, it means that he isn't, he isn't filled with the Holy Spirit. If we're just living for the flesh, we're not filled for, with the Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus wants us not to have some of the Holy Spirit, right? What? All of the Holy Spirit. Very good, yes. You know, the, the, the parable with the ten virgins, right? Some of them had uh, some, and some of them had all of it, right? The Holy Spirit. Jesus wants us to be filled, top to bottom, not to be partial, right? Because when you're partial, you're like the carnal man. That's what, that's what Paul is talking about. And we get into that rhythm of being uh, carnal or partial, some people think this group only consists of people who live in uh, blatant sin. So the carnal man, uh, uh, he's just a, you know, he's a sinful man. He's out there in the world. He's going to the bars and he's doing all these crazy stuff, right? He's going down Jamaica and doing all this crazy stuff, right? Blatant sin. Or going in Vegas and all this crazy stuff, right? But this is only one of many shades within the group. I want to stress again that there are lots of differences within each of these groups, and the carnal group is a lot of things. A person can a person can have great biblical knowledge and still not grow spiritually. They know the Bible back and forth, man, and still not grow spiritually. Still not grow spiritually. Spiritual growth has to do with our complete, not partial, but complete dedication to Jesus and a constant life in the Holy Spirit. You're talking about really full commitment. Full commitment. You know, I read a book uh, a couple years ago. I don't read a lot of novels and books like that. Um, I spend my time reading a lot of math book, which is boring. <laughs> Those I peruse through. But just ordinary books. Um, I think it was, it was something to do with Navy SEAL. I made a movie out of it. But it's all about this guy who they got shot up in, in Iraq and in the mountains. Soul Survivor, was that what it's called? Something like that. And he was the one though, from the Navy, from a group of Navy, Navy SEAL who survived. All his comrades died up on the mountain getting shot up. He was shot up himself, but he somehow got pulled out last minute. And it, told, it talked about the training that the SEALs went through. I didn't know that. They might start off with 100 guys, all show up, you know. They say, come on, get on in. And by probably week two or three, they're all, they had to go up, and they let them go up. They have to decide by themselves. The system was, if you can't take it, you go up and ring the bell and walk. There's a lot of people ringing the bell, walking, until they get down to a group of really hardcore guys who had stayed in there and didn't ring the bell. And this, this, the, the training that they go through, 
staying in cold water for hours, swimming, and, and, and no food, and no rest, and staying up for so many hours, and still had to be sharp. Still had to be sharp. And I think about this when I read this as saying, God wants a complete dedication, just like the Navy SEAL wanted for these guys. It wasn't half, it wasn't half hearted stuff. You had to be in or out. In or out. That's it. <laughs> and that's what Jesus is saying. Are we in or are we out? Reminds me of, uh, is in the book, Revelation chapter three. Uh, is that, I believe? I think it's Revelation chapter 3, right? Where God talks about you're, you're what? Lukewarm? You're neither hot or cold? And so what is he going to do? He's going to spew you out. <laughs> and so the same thing with us today. God says, I don't want you partial. I'd rather you just make your mind up. You know? I'd rather you make your mind up. I'd rather you just be an infidel. And make your mind up. Or to be half in here, not in here, not committed, partial. Somewhere in Ellen, in Ellen's writings, she talks about that, uh, what these, these, this, this carnal person, like myself, I'm not talking about you, I'm about myself. This carnal person, you know, you're in and you're out, you're halfway. They're worse than infidels. Somewhere in her writings, she talks about that, right? Joe was saying, yeah. Imagine that. Worse than infidels. Because we, we sit and we have, we have a comfort life and we use our, our, our theories or what we feel to stop the progress of the church. We just sit there and do that. The infidel, he's out there, man. He's not even care about what we're doing here. You know, he's on his own. But we, we sit. And we get involved. And that's more of a trouble. Infidel is really not the trouble. <laughs> you know? Again other, again, other carnal Christians might be enthusiastic. You know, we're all, oh yeah, let's do it. Probably like myself. Hey, yes, do it for evangelism, you know. They are glad that they know Bible truth. Carnal church members can be very active, even, at, even have leading positions in local church. Again, talking about myself, right? Right? We can be up here, we can be preaching, and we can be doing all this stuff. Um, and it still can be that we are carnal, right? Carnal. Matthew 7, verse 22 to 23. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then when I, and then I will declare to them, I never know you. I never know you. Jesus did not live in the heart. We were doing all these things, but Jesus did not live in the heart. He didn't know us. Yeah, can it be that way? Can we get that way? He didn't live in the heart through the Holy Spirit. Thus they had no personal relationship with Christ. So there might be an apparent connection on the, on the outside, but on the inside, I didn't know him. I had no idea who he really, truly was. Because of the busy, all oh, busy I get, and my, my, my beliefs, and my doctrine, and my things that, the things that I want to think about, and they just make sense to me, but it didn't make sense to God. Never made sense to God. As spirit contrary to the spirit of Christ would deny him, whatever the profession, men may deny Christ by evil speaking. Have we done that? Well, have I done that? Yes. Foolish talking. Have I done that? Yes. By words that are untruthful or unkind. Have I done that? Yes. 
They may deny him by shunning life's, uh, by shunning life's burden, by the pursuit of sinful pleasure, right? You get it? We just want to do this stuff. We don't care how much it costs, right? Just do it. They may, they may deny him by conforming to the world, by uncourteous behavior, by the love of their own opinion. Boy, I tell you, I love my opinion. I don't want to be wrong, man. Get that going. <laughs> right? You come to my Sabbath school class, you'll find out. Oh, I spy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Who said that? <laughs> right? So we do that. We do these things. Uh, we dwell in darkness. We dwell on things that shouldn't be dwell on for a while. So what could be, I'm just pointing out some things, what could be causing this, this step back from being in evangelistic mode? What can be, what be, can, can some of the causes be? Well, well, that, yeah, and self. And, and Paul talks about that. Are we willing to take the step? Are we willing to go outside of our, of our comfort zone? It's not easy. It's very hard. Why is surrendering our lives so important? Why is this continuous surrendering so important? Why is it? Why is this continuous surrendering so important? I just read a couple of these and then we'll leave. I recommend you get this book. It's a great book. It will start to really put things together. You know, we're supposed to do this revival. We're supposed to be doing this revival phase for about five weeks, I believe, Lori, right? About nine weeks, right? So we start. We're supposed to start off in this revival phase. So we find something to be to bring us to revival. Be it, again, be it this book, or be it the fast program they have out there, or another way we want to come together as a church. Whichever way, whichever way is great. God answer our basic commitment with this. Why is it so important? Remember John chapter three, right? Verses one. They're 21. Remember that experience? God talks to Nicodemus, right? You must be what? Born again. Reborn. Right? Reborn. But here's the issue. We could probably be reborn, right? And nothing happens. And it happens a lot. So what's the change? God wants us to be reborn, but for us to be what? To continually be connected to him after the rebirth. Not just reborn, but it's a continuous process of staying connected to him. And that's where the rubber meets the road, right? That's where it really hard. It gets hard because life steps in the way. And we got to do these things we got to do. And we got to have these feelings we got to have, whichever way we want to justify him. You know, I, I justify him by saying I'm from Jamaica. That's how I justify him, you know. I use that card all the time. I, probably one day it will, it will run out, but I use it all the time. I'm going to use that one all the time, man. <laughs> so identifying, identifying this carnal person is very hard because it's talking about me. And I'm not going to want to give up my ID and say, hey, I'm carnal. I'm not going to give that up, right? No. I'm going to show you that, hey, I'm a spiritual person, man. You know? I'm a spiritual person. I'm not the natural infidel over there. I'm a spiritual person. But the carnal person, you know, uh, yeah, I'm not that either. I don't even want to talk about that. Here's, here's one, of this, here's one of, and I'll let you go after this, but uh, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. I just point to that one of the identification point of the um, carnal person. Where's my signal? Oh. Revelation chapter 3. Last one. Revelation chapter 3. Ah. Chapter 3. I believe it's verse 20. Let's see. Let's see. Where is it spelling? Yeah. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, right? This is one of the last thing I want to identify. There's a lot more in the in this book. You wanna you wanna really try to put a hands on this stuff, right? 
It talks about all the identification marks of this carnal person, man. And we have read them and see them a lot. But listen, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him. Let me read it again. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I stand at the door and knock. And, uh, sorry, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come, come into him and sup with him. Amen? Yeah. You know, for the carnal person, guess what? But this is saying, the carnal person, Jesus is always there doing this. He never comes in. We never let him in. But he stands there all the time. And does this. That's for the carnal person, right? There is hope for us, though, right? There is hope. We can be spiritual. And that's what Paul is saying. We can be spiritual. That's what the gospel is about. We can have that continual commitment to be reborn and to continue to grow constantly. And this will put us in, on fire uh, in amazement as to what God can do through us. And then we're ready to touch those around us and let them know and be excited about it. I liked also in this verse, you know, there's a lot of math in this verse right here. Let me show you what I mean. It's one directional, if you notice. It says, if I stand and knock and, and you open the door, right, I will come in. It's not the other way. It's not the other way. It's not the other direction. God is not just going to force himself in, right? No. It's not going to. You stand and he knocks. And he allows you to open the door. And let us in. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, there's a lot to be said about your work that you have for us today and what you've called us to do. Continue to convict our hearts. Send the Holy Spirit to lead us and direct us that we can uh, touch people around us in our sphere and in, 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 in how we go about our day that they might see you and that we might be put aside. They're drawn to you and not to us. We thank you for the task that's held out ahead of us to always try to evangelize in whatever form, in whatever phase, in whatever color, in whatever mode, that we don't stop but continue to keep going. Teach us about your faith and what it means to step out and what it means to see things happening outside of ourselves. We thank you for your, your son that you've sent, for his life of righteousness and faith that he lived. These things we pray in his name. Amen.